Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Alistair Nimmo and I'm an anaesthetist in Edinburgh. I'm going to talk about uh, TIVA and NAP5. As you know, there are some reasons why TIVA may be more or less likely to be associated with accidental awareness than volatile anaesthesia. During maintenance with a volatile, we can measure the end tidal anaesthetic gas concentration. And it's been demonstrated that if alarms are set to ensure that is kept above 0.7 mac, the risk of awareness is reduced. On the other hand, two-thirds of the cases reported to NAP5 did not occur during this maintenance phase of anaesthesia. And many of the cases occurred during the so-called gaps in between the administration of an intravenous bolus induction and the volatile maintenance. Or at the end of surgery, some of the cases occurred in a gap between the offset of the volatile and the commencement of an intravenous infusion for transfer to ICU or ventilation in the recovery room. So there are both advantages and disadvantages to the use of a volatile. With intravenous anaesthesia for maintenance, we can't measure end tidal anaesthetic gas concentration to confirm that the drug is indeed being delivered, though we can monitor <coughs> drug effect with a processed EEG monitor such as the BIS. And gaps in drug delivery at the start or end of the procedure are less likely. Some previous studies have concluded that TIVA is associated with a higher risk of accidental awareness, as of some review articles. Other studies and review articles have concluded that there is no difference between volatile and intravenous anaesthesia. And I think there probably isn't a single answer to this question. The relative risks of volatile and intravenous anaesthesia are going to depend on the, the drugs used. We've already talked about the differences between different volatile agents, it's going to depend on the local practice in terms of dose ranges, and they're going to depend on education and training. Because whatever, whatever else is the case, if anaesthetists are not as familiar with intravenous anaesthesia as with volatile anaesthesia, they may be at a higher risk of not doing it well. So I don't think that a conclusion in one year or in one country can necessarily be extrapolated to another country or another year to give an overall answer as to whether intravenous anaesthesia is associated with a higher risk. But NAP5 can provide us with some information on the relative frequency with which patients having either volatile or intravenous anaesthesia report accidental awareness with current UK practice. And importantly, can enable common causes of awareness during intravenous anaesthesia to be identified and recommend recommendations to be made to reduce this risk. And I think an important point is that this talk is relevant not just to those of us like myself who prefer to use intravenous <coughs> anaesthesia for most anaesthetics, but to all anaesthetists, because all anaesthetists who give an anaesthetic need to be able to give an intravenous anaesthesia at times. Some areas don't have vaporizers. Some patients, either predictably or unpredictably, require post-operative ventilation in recovery, post-operative ventilation in ICU, and we all need to be able to maintain anaesthesia with intravenous drugs in those patients. And indeed, if we look at the NAP5 results, there were 31 reports of uh, accidental awareness in patients who received intravenous anaesthesia maintenance at some point during their anaesthetic. That was uh, 28 class A or B reports and three of the ICU reports. And in 12 of these cases, volatile anaesthesia was not an option, either because anaesthesia was given in an area without vaporizers or because surgery was in the airway and it was difficult to deliver volatile anaesthesia. So this is about 40% of the cases it wasn't possible to give a volatile anaesthetic. So there may not be a choice, and all anaesthetists need to be able to give an intravenous anaesthetic. I've separated out here those anaesthetics that were started in the anaesthetic room or theatre so that it was possible to use a volatile anaesthetic, at least during part of the procedure. And there were 24 certain or probable or possible reports in patients who had either intravenous anaesthesia throughout or both volatile and intravenous anaesthesia maintenance. And you can see here there were nine Class A cases with TIVA, two with manual infusions, one with intermittent propofol boluses, and seven patients had maintenance with both volatile and intravenous anaesthesia, either concurrently or sequentially, and I'll, I'll come back to that. And we can compare these figures with the figures from the activity survey, so that what we can see here is that this is the proportion of anaesthetics given in anaesthetic room or theatre which have a volatile maintenance and intravenous maintenance with TCI. This is the proportion of reports 
in NAP5, and looking at a ratio, it's nearly twice as common for there to be reports in patients who've had TIVA in theatre than it is with volatiles. So there's a higher incidence of reports with intravenous anaesthesia. However, if we look at the patients who had both volatile and intravenous anaesthesia, and in the majority of cases that was volatile for maintenance in theatre, and then a propofol infusion for transfer to ITU, transfer to recovery for ventilation, transfer to x-ray for a further procedure, there was a 17 times higher incidence of awareness. It may be that the activity survey missed some of the cases who had both volatile and propofol infusions. Perhaps some of those were not coded correctly. But I think it's very unlikely that 5% of our patients are getting both volatile and intravenous maintenance. I think we can be confident there's a pretty small proportion of our patients. And that was 5% of the reports of accidental awareness. So while intravenous anesthesia alone in theatre is associated with a somewhat higher risk than volatile, once you start giving a volatile and switching to intravenous because you have to, the risk is very much higher. <coughs> when intravenous <coughs> anesthesia alone was given in theatre, there were 12 Class A reports, five possible reports. These reports were classed as being possible rather than probable or certain awareness, largely because we didn't have very much information in many of them, and, and it was difficult to establish exactly during which period of the operation awareness might have occurred or what the causal factors were. So in terms of looking at causation, we've concentrated on the certain or probable awarenesses. Eight of the 12 involved what I would call standard target-controlled infusions, where you use propofol or propofol and remifentanil in separate syringes and target-controlled infusion pumps. In four of these cases, there was failure to deliver the intended dose of propofol. Two tissued cannulae. In one case, the anaesthetist put the propofol syringe in the remifentanil pump and therefore gave much less propofol than was intended. And remarkably, in one case, the anaesthetist did not connect the propofol infusion before the induction, pressed the buttons on the pump and gave the muscle relaxant, but didn't actually give any propofol. So that was in half the cases the drug wasn't delivered as intended. In two cases, the muscle relaxant was given before the patient was asleep. And in two cases, the patient was allowed to awaken at the end before the muscle relaxant had worn off. What surprised me was that we didn't have any of these, any reports of cases where the anaesthetist had simply given the wrong dose, chosen a target of three rather than four. A lot of the discussion at intravenous anaesthesia meetings is about should you use the MARSH model for propofol, should you use a different model, it's about technical details. Here it was just not giving the drug you intended or giving it uh, or letting the patient uh, be paralysed either before they'd induced anaesthesia or after they'd awoken. It wasn't about the minutiae of exactly which target or model. In terms of, of preventing this, the, the Safe Anaesthesia Liaison Group uh, has uh, published guidance which is on the, on the uh, college website on guaranteeing drug delivery in total intravenous anaesthesia, which talks about having cannulae visible where possible, having anti-siphon valves and so on. And there are further details in the report uh, on this theme. And in terms of the patients being paralysed before they're asleep or allowed to waken up while still paralysed, I think these recommendations, which are from the Chapter 8 on induction and Chapter 10 on emergence, are very relevant. That you should assess for loss of consciousness during routine induction before giving the muscle relaxant by things such as speaking to the patient or giving a jaw thrust and give the muscle relaxant once the patient's asleep. And that's particularly valuable in intravenous anaesthesia because the target-controlled infusion pumps will display an estimated brain concentration of propofol at the time the patient loses response to speech, at the time they lose response to a painful jaw thrust. And that's very useful information in helping you judge what concentration you need during surgery. And to just give the muscle relaxant before the patient has even lost consciousness clearly is not a sensible thing to do. And similarly, this applies equally to volatiles, but it's been relevant to two of the eight uh, TCI cases in theatre. Patients should have recovered from the muscle relaxant before they're allowed to wake up at the end of surgery. There were four cases of the 12 uh, intravenous infusion cases in theatre that were not TCI or not standard TCI. In one, propofol and remifentanil were mixed in the same syringe, and I, I'm not clear if this was used with the propofol TCI model or not. Um, one case involved boluses and manual infusions. Uh, one case involved a combined spinal epidural anaesthetic 
with a manual propofol infusion. Uh, the patient breathed spontaneously from a Hudson-type mask and no bonus was recorded as being given. This seems a bit more akin to uh, an orthopaedic procedure under sedation, a combined spinal epidural and a fixed rate propofol infusion, but it was coded by the local coordinator as being an intended GA and therefore uh, analysed as such. And there was one case in which manual bonuses of propofol were given and the anaesthetist mistakenly thought the uh, operation was finished and stopped administering manual bonuses of propofol. So these were the cases of pure intravenous anaesthesia in theatre. Coming back to these seven cases where both volatile agent uh, and propofol were given, uh, in two they were given simultaneously, one cardiac and one non-cardiac case. Uh, in one case, an inhalational induction in a child was followed by maintenance with intravenous propofol, and there appeared to be a gap between the volatile wearing off and the propofol taking effect during which the child uh, had a brief period of recall. And in four cases, the volatile was turned off after a procedure in theatre, and a manual infusion of propofol was started uh, for transfer to ICU or radiology or recovery. In one case, the cannula was thought to have tissued, and the other three cases, the dose of propofol appeared to be inadequate. And if we look at the cases of uh, intravenous anaesthesia outside theatre, four Class A reports and three that uh, Richard Paul mentioned earlier in ICU of patients having uh, anaesthesia in the ICU, the emergency department, radiology, um, all of these were manual infusions of propofol, not target controlled infusions. And in most cases, the cause appeared to be inappropriately low doses of propofol. And there are some, in the report, some pharmacokinetic simulations of, of uh, the likely blood and brain concentrations of propofol. This is a typical anaesthetic in theatre with the estimated concentrations here and the infusion rates. This is one of the reports where the patient was simply started on an infusion of 10 mils an hour of propofol with no bolus. And it really is very unlikely that, that is going to achieve uh, loss of consciousness. Uh, so in these cases outside theatre, it appeared to be clearly inappropriately low doses that were the main causative factor. Uh, Vota's going to speak in a minute about neuromuscular blockers, but there were only two of the TIVA cases in which, uh, or two of the Class A cases where we were able to be, uh, have information on causation, only two of these cases in which no neuromuscular blocker had been given. And those were the cases I just mentioned, the combined spinal epidural with a, a fixed uh, infusion of propofol and the patient remembered their leg being positioned before surgery, uh, and the case in which manual bonuses were given and the anaesthetist mistakenly thought the procedure was finished. Apart from that, the cases of accidental awareness with TIVA were cases of neuromuscular blockade. And that has implications if we're going to make recommendations about making sure cannulae are visible, using BIS monitors and so on. I think these really need to be focused on the patients who have received a neuromuscular blocker. The case review panel assessed, was able to assess preventability in 25 of these cases, they had enough information to do so, and 19 or 76% were thought to be preventable, and it was thought that the commonest contributory factor was inadequate education and training. So there was a higher incidence with <coughs> intravenous anaesthesia. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the technique is intrinsically, so it has to be associated with a higher incidence because most of these cases were preventable and education and training did not seem to be adequate. And there have been a number of surveys of trainees in the United Kingdom in recent years about their experience of, of training in intravenous anaesthesia. And all the ones I've seen have concluded that the trainees felt that they'd had an inadequate training and were not competent using intravenous anaesthesia. So TiVo was more frequent. Uh, more, more frequently associated with accidental uh, awareness and in particular changing from volatile anaesthetic to intravenous anaesthesia at the end of a case or giving TIVA outside the operating theatre, which is where you don't have a choice and you have to give TIVA, those were the situations that were particularly associated with a high incidence of accidental awareness. Three quarters of the cases were considered to be preventable. The commonest factor was inadequate education and training. Almost all the patients had received a neuromuscular block in theatre, it's target-controlled infusions that are given, and the causes seem to be usually failing to deliver the intended dose of propofol or paralysing a patient before they were asleep, allowing them to awake while still paralysed. During transfer and outside theatre, it was inappropriately low fixed-rate infusions that were, seemed to be the main cause. The recommendations that were made were that all anaesthetists should be trained in the maintenance of anaesthesia with intravenous infusions. Where practical, that anaesthetists should ensure that the cannula used for intravenous anaesthesia is visible throughout the procedure. 
I know that uh, JDAP is going to talk about depth of anaesthesia monitoring uh, later, but uh, it was concluded that depth of anaesthesia monitoring should be considered where patients having TIVA are at higher risk, such as patients receiving neuromuscular blockade, and that relevant anaesthetic organisations should set standards and recommendations for best practice in the use of TIVA. Thank you.